This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be more about Dirichlet characters as part of the proof of Dirichlet's theorem. So we just quickly recall that a Dirichlet character is a homomorphism from the multiplicative group Z modulo N Z star to the non-zero complex numbers. Uh, and it's usually denoted by chi. Um, so an alternative way of saying this is that chi is a function from integers to complex numbers such that chi of um, m plus n is equal to chi of m and chi of m equals zero if m and n are co-prime and chi is multiplicative so chi of m n is equal to chi of m times chi of n and we should also make sure it's non-trivial by saying um, that chi of 1 is equal to 1. And last lecture we saw several examples of this and in particular we saw that the number of characters of um, z modulo nz star is equal to the order of z over nz star. And what we're going to do now is to just uh, discuss some properties of, of characters in more detail. And before we go on, uh, just notice that we can actually define a character for any finite abelian group um, um, a G. G uh, a character is just going to be a homomorphism from G to the non-zero complex numbers. And again, we can check that the number of characters of a finite abelian group is equal to the order of the group G. And the proof of this is more or less the same as what we did last lecture for in the special case of Z over NZ star. So you remember what we did is we pretty much decomposed Z over NZ star into a product of cyclic groups and proved the theorem for cyclic groups and then used the Chinese remainder theorem to, to deduce it for general N. And any finite abelian group can also be written as a product of cyclic groups, so we can more or less copy the previous proof. Um, in fact, the set of characters of G is itself a group, because we can define the products of two characters. If we've got two characters, chi1 and chi2, we can define a new character, chi1, chi2 of G, to be chi1 of G times chi2 of G. So for any finite abelian group, we get a, a new group called the character group. Um, in fact, we, we, we get a sort of pairing from G times its character group. Um, to the complex numbers or non-zero complex numbers. So, so this just takes G and a character to the value of a character on, on G. And if you want to be really clever, you can think of... Um, an element of G as being a character of the character group, because if we fix G, then this gives a homomorphism from characters to complex numbers. You know, chi1, chi2 of G is equal to chi1 of G times chi2 of G. So, 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 so G is really a homomorphism from the character group to the non-zero complex numbers. So <laughs> you, you have this rather confusing thing that the characters of the group of characters of G is G itself. Um, if you've done linear algebra, you remember there's something similar for vector spaces, that any vector space is a dual, and the dual of the dual of a vector space is the vector space you first thought of. Um, so characters of finite abelian groups are kind of similar. Um, another way in which characters turn up is, is that characters are very closely related to Fourier theory. So you remember, if we've got a periodic function f such that f of x plus 2 pi is equal to f of x on the real numbers, then, the, 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 then you can generally write f as a sum of um, um, functions sine 2 pi n and cosine 2 pi n with 2 pi n x and cosine 2 pi n x with various Fourier coefficients of these. Um, now, instead of using sines and cosines, it's often easier to use uh, two pi shouldn't be there. It's often easier to use e to the um, 
i n x for all integers n. And these functions e to the i n x are just the characters of the group, the re if you take the reals, modulo 2 pi z. So periodic functions are just functions on the reals modulo 2 pi z. And um, this group has a collection of characters, and the characters are just um, these exponentials e to the pi n x, which are more or less the same as sines and cosines, um, if, you, if you don't worry about linear combinations. So you should think of the characters of a finite abelian group as being analogous to these functions e to the i n x for periodic functions on the reals. Um, and now, just as you can expand any function as a linear combination of these functions e to the i n x, you can expand any function on g as a linear combination of its characters, and we're going to do this for z over n z star. So the first, um, so what we want to do is to show that any function on z over n z star is a linear combination of these Dirichlet characters. We will be using this in the proof of Dirichlet's theorem. And what you notice is that the, if you take the space of functions on here, these just form a vector space of dimension equal to phi of n, um, because um, just as a basis of um, elements that are one on some element of this group and zero elsewhere. And we know the number of characters is also phi of n. So to show everything is a linear combination of characters, all we need to do is to show the characters are linearly independent as vectors in a vector space. Um, and to do this, we're going to show that they are, in fact, orthogonal. So in order to make them orthogonal, we, we, we should quickly explain what we mean by orthogonality. So if we've got two functions on z modulo n z star, we just define the inner product to be um, sum of um, n in z modulo n z star of f of n times g of n, and then we put a complex conjugate sign on there. This makes sure that the inner product of f with itself is always greater than or equal to zero, because it's a sum of fn times fn bar. So, so um, the, 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 these form a complex vector space with a nice positive definite emission inner product on it. And now we want to show that any two characters are orthogonal if chi1 is not equal to chi of 2. So this is just sum over chi1 of n times chi2 of n complex conjugated. Um, and we notice that chi2 of n bar times chi2 of n is always equal to 1 because um, it's, a, it's a root of unity, so it's absolute value 1. So this is just sum over n of chi1 of n chi 2 of n to minus 1. And this is just the sum over n of chi 3 of n, where chi 3 is the character chi 1, chi 2 to minus 1. So all we want to do is to show that this is 0 if chi 3 is not the, 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 the unit character. I mean, if, if a character is 1 everywhere, then obviously the sum is non-zero. So we want to show if chi 3 is not 1, then this sum is non-zero. So suppose chi of m is non-zero for some m in z modulo n z star. Well, what you do is we notice that sum over chi 3 of n, that's chi 3, is equal to the sum over chi, th sorry, the sum over chi 3 of n times m, because if you multiply by the um, number m, that's a that, that's a bijection from the integers mod n to itself. And this is also equal to chi 3 of m 
times the sum of chi 3 of n because chi 3 is multiplicative. So we have the following identity chi 3 of m minus 1 times um, sum over n of chi 3 of n is equal to 0. And if chi 3 of m is not equal to 1, then this is non zero, so this implies the sum over n of chi 3 of n is equal to zero. So um, if we've got any character which isn't one everywhere, then the sum over all the, the, then the sum of its elements over z modulo n is always zero, and this implies orthogonality of characters. Well, since the characters are orthogonal, this obviously implies they're linearly independent which implies they span um, the space of all functions on z modulo nz star. And the way we're going to use this is we're going to take a function f of um, n, which is equal to 1 if n is congruent to some number b modulo n, and naught if n is not congruent to b modulo n. And we're going to use this to show that there are infinitely many primes which are congruent to b modulo big N by, by expressing this function as a linear combination of characters. Um, now we should discuss um, convergence of um, um, Dirichlet series. So we've got the series sum over... Um, n of chi of n over n to the s, which is going to be chi of 1 over 1 to the s plus chi of 2 over 2 to the s, and so on. And we want to know where it converges. The first thing to notice is that it converges absolutely for the real part of s greater than 1. Well, we're just using s to be real, so let's just say s greater than 1. And this follows because 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on converges for s greater than 1 and chi of, chi of n has absolute value at most 1. So by comparison with this series it converges. Um, nice thing is it also converges for s greater than 0 if chi is not always 1. If chi is always 1, it, it diverges for s equals 1, but for all the other characters it actually converges, um, which is kind of useful to know. And um, for these, you, you just use Dirichlet's convergence theorem. It says that if some numbers a1, if, if we've got some numbers ai and bi such that a1 plus a2 and so on plus an is always bounded, and um, bi is decreasing and tends to zero, then the sum of ai bi converges. And to see this, um, we just look at an expression like a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus a3 b3 plus a4 b4, say, and we can rewrite this as follows. It's a1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4 times um, B1 plus A1 plus A plus sorry, A2 plus A3 plus A4 times B2 minus B1 plus A3 plus A4 times B3 minus B2 plus A4 times um, B4 minus B3. So you notice these um, things are all um, bounded, and all these sums are bounded. So suppose that the, the, the sum is bounded by, say, some number m, then this is going to be bounded by, um, at most, m times, um, um, say, 2b1, because the sum of all these numbers will be sort of at most 2b1. So, so this sum here is going to be at most, um, sort of, say, 2m times b1. Um, similarly, if we take the partial sums 
an AIBI plus plus ANBN, this will be at most 2M times BI. And this tends to zero because BI tends to zero. And so um, um, Cauchy's um, principle of convergence says that if all these partial sums um, sort of tend to zero as I tends to zero, then our original series converges. So sum of AIBI converges. Now we're going to apply this by taking ai to be chi of i for some character i and bi equals 1 over n to the s. Then the sum of the a i b i is, is just the Dirichlet series L of s which is chi 1 over 1 to the s plus chi 2 over 2 to the s and so on. And these numbers here are obviously um, decreasing and they tend to zero. So all we've got to do is to show that um, the numbers a1 plus a2 and so on plus a n are bounded. And this follows because um, um, the sum over, if we take i mod n of chi i, then this is bounded. That the, 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 sorry, this is not bounded. This is equal to zero. So if we take the sum of the first n values of chi i, this will be zero, and the sum of the next n will be zero, and so on. So um, the, the sum of any number of them will be at most the sum of the first n of them, which is going to be bounded. It will be bounded by at most n, in fact, if chi has period n. Um, you, you can give better bounds than that, but that uh, turns out to be a kind of slightly subtle problem. Um, final topic we I just want to mention is, is the notion of primitive characters. So um, you remember that some characters modulo n aren't really new. For instance, if we had n equals 4, for example, we had one character um, which gave us an L series 1 over 1 to the S plus 1 over 3 to the S plus 1 over 5 to the S and another one which gave us 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s and so on. And this one was not new. And this one really was new. Um, it, it was uh, nothing to do with any previous characters we had. And, and the characters that are new are called primitive. So a character um, mod n is called primitive. If it's not equal on, on z modulo n z star to a character for some smaller um, n. So, so here um, this is equal to the character which is just one everywhere um, on z modulo 4 z star, which is why this, this isn't really a new character. And we can count how many new characters there are. Suppose n is a prime power, p to the n. Well, then we get um, um, that, that there are altogether psi of p to the n characters, but we can get psi of p to the n minus 1 um, old characters, because we can take any character modulo p to the n minus 1, and that will give us a non-primitive character modulo p to the n. So the number of primitive characters is going to be psi of p to the n minus psi of p to the n minus 1, which is p minus 1 times p to the n minus 1 minus p to the p minus 1 times p to the n minus 2. That's provided n is greater than or equal to 2. So that will be um, um, so, so, so that will be p to the n minus 2. 2 times p minus 1 squared for n greater than or equal to 2. But for n um, equal 1, we've got to be a little bit careful because um, the, 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 that, that no longer quite makes sense. The, the phi of p to the p to the 0 has, is given by slightly different formulas. So, so we get p minus 2 characters if n equals 1. That's primitive characters. And in general, if n is a product of prime powers, the number of primitive characters is the product of the primitive characters for each of these prime powers. 
Notice, by the way, this is actually zero if p equals two. So for numbers of the form two times something odd, there are no primitive characters. Um, we saw this earlier when we found there were no primitive characters um, modulo two or modulo six. Um, and for something like, so, so if you want the number of primitive characters for 12, for example, well, 12 is equal to two squared times three, and there's one primitive character for two squared, and there's one for three, so altogether we get one times one equals one primitive character modulo 12, which is the one we found last lecture. Um, okay, so next lecture, what we'll be doing is explaining how to deduce Dirichlet's theorem if you know that all the L series don't vanish at s equals one, and after that, the next lecture, we will show that they don't vanish at s equals one.